Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Lenko, and on behalf of Eastern Melbourne PHN, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this arthritis update. Eastern Health and Eastern Melbourne PHN would like to acknowledge and thank the traditional custodians on whose unceded lands that people may be viewing from. I acknowledge that I'm dialing in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I wish to pay my respects to Elders past and present, and I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the first peoples of Australia. I'd like to thank the Elders for their care and protection of our beautiful country. The housekeeping for tonight is as follows. Everyone is on, all attendees are on mute and the chat function is not available for this session. We will have question and answer at the end of the presentation. So please ask your questions by writing them into the Q&A box as you think of them. The session is being recorded and the link that will be emailed to participants along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides and your attendance certificate in about seven to 10 days. Now we haven't applied for RACGP CPD points for this event. On that note, I'd like to hang, hand over to Dr. Tong Lee, who is the Acting GP Liaison Officer for Eastern Health, and who will be facilitating the session this evening. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much, Steph. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, giving up your Tuesday evening and joining us for this, what looks to be a very exciting session. Um, um, so for those of you, if you don't know me, I'm, my name's Tong Lee, I'm the uh, Acting GP Liaison Officer at Eastern Health. Uh, I started in this role in um, uh, April, and really the idea about these education events is just to, 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 to um, connect uh, Eastern Health with our GP community a little bit more. I was always hoping to have these events in person, but uh, with the current COVID cl uh, climate, it's been very hard to organise such events um, in person, um, so, which is a shame because I'm, in my role, it's, it's always been my hope to meet GPs in the Eastern Health uh, area. Um, we have two presenters tonight. Uh, firstly, I'll introduce our first speaker uh, for the evening. Um, Dr. Chris Fong is a dual trained rheumatologist and geriatrician. Uh, he is the clinical director of, of rheumatology at Eastern Health. Um, at Eastern Health, he practices at the rheumatology clinic uh, at Box Hill, uh, also at the conjoint ortho hip and knee service alongside physiotherapists and orthopedic surgeons. Uh, he's also involved with the metabolic bone clinic at Marunda Hospital. Um, in addition, he has an academic appointment with Monash University as, as an adjunct senior lecturer. Um, he also has private practice at Epworth Camberwell and Epworth Eastern. However, he tells me that he's not taking any more patients, but he will see um, special patients if you if you ask him very nicely in your referrals. Um, um, I uh, won't take up any more of uh, his time. So Chris, um, thanks again for agreeing to present tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Tong. And thank you everyone for coming and thank you for inviting me. I'm hoping this will be a bit of, uh, it, was, it was good to, as I said, to, to get everyone together, even in this COVID times, but it'd be great to have people together. And please ask lots of questions. I think the question and answer, and I'll try and make it as uh, interactive as possible with um, the, the screening and Zoom, which is uh, uh, with, with all this that's happening. Now, uh, let me just get it. Okay, let's get this from the beginning. Can you see my slides? Uh, okay. Yeah, we can see them, Chris. Okay, resume slideshow. Good, okay. So we've got acknowledgement of country and this is our talk. Basically, I, I want to talk mainly of the, as I said in my summary about seronegative arthritis in part with psoriatic arthritis because it's quite a conundrum in part with actually diagnosing it. It's not a spot diagnosis, it takes a while. And the other things we can miss things and also how we manage that because the, uh, they've got different presentations and they also have different you know, complications. And, and some, some, some are fairly benign, but some are unfortunately the ones, some of the slides we tend to show or medical students tend to be, you know, the ones we see in hospitals tend to be uh, uh, more, um, uh, more, more uh, uh, joint uh, disruptions and some systemic problems. But hope, so uh, these are my conflict of interest. I always get employed by those hospitals and 
I've also done have research grants with companies. I've also done research for the uh, government and the engine NHMRC, including back pay. Now, the idea was basically to, to show when do you suspect that someone have an inflammatory arthritis in particular or psoriatic arthritis. And I'll, I'll make it very general because patients, you know, this is one of the problems now. We our specialty clinics. We have concerns about registrars who's going to a specialty clinic. They turn up at a scleroderma clinic and say this is scleroderma. I don't never know how to diagnose. And these are the ones that, you know, for you guys at the call phase, all the GPs in part, it's difficult. And sometimes you have to come back. And I'll give you a few little tips. And sometimes you have to bring the patient back and re-examine. Um, I want you to give you a little bit on what we call a Casper criteria. And you know, unfortunately, rheumatologists also keep on changing their uh, criteria for uh, classification, research, and diagnosis. But um, this is the idea that most people are now using it until I know until they get together in a few years' time and maybe get a bowel mark. And it's a long way. It's a clinical diagnosis. The other things I'm really hoping you guys can help me is once we diagnose it, how we can help with your uh, enhanced Medicare lifestyle management. And if you start drugs, how you can help me manage all the other um, the toxicities and getting them ready for the medications, including vaccinations and uh, making sure they're not uh, getting toxicity from their medications. Okay, this is my dog. Many, many years ago, I don't know if you've seen this, I gave a talk many years ago. Um, this is a child, for all you know. Uh, unfortunately, this, with many years of inherited breeding, they get uh, horrible short hips and they get osteoarthritis. And this is what my dog had eventually. And this is the other thing, I think you can see that rash on the nose. It's a photosensitive rash. And I wish I could talk to you more, but for those dermatologists among you, a photosensitive rash on the dog and a biopsy showed lupus. So unfortunately, you got into steroids, which cause all the problems. And that's what we don't like in uh, rheumatology as well. Steroids cause lots of problems. And that's why I'm a rheumatologist and a geriatrician. Okay, now up to, we know that in psoriasis, up to 30% of psoriasis develop arthritis, but depending on who you read and everything, probably more in hospital, the triggers are trauma, bacteria, and smoking. There are some genetic markers now just coming up, but it's still very, very early days. <laughs> um, and one of the triggers I wasn't going to say, it was quite interesting. It may be some, some evidence that some of the vaccines, the COVID vaccines causing it. And obviously we always know that viruses, including COVID viruses do flare up arthritis. The differentials of oligoarticular arthritis really want you to make, make sure. And I think uh, Tong will show you on the, uh, there's a, on the, um, um, the website, Healthcare Pathways website for GPs is sepsis because when it's one single joint, it comes up very suddenly hot painful and red, really need to aspirate it. And I wouldn't wait for, you know, to, to send them to a rheumatology clinic. They actually need to come to emergency that they get it aspirated and make sure it's not septic. In particular, I'm sure you know all the red, yellow flags and red flags, patients who are immunosuppressed, steroids, cancer patients, transplants. Um, the other differentials are obviously crystal arthropathy, but gout, Oh, um, you know, there, there are, the first presentation is always difficult, but, you know, obviously it's good, still important to aspirate it. And people with gout still also get um, uh, sepsis. It can coexist. And uh, so be very careful. And then obviously the differential is seronegative, which includes the psoriatic, peripheral manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis, ulcerative colitis, and reactive arthritis. Uh, polyarticular arthritis is the one you'll come and see. So multiple small joints, multiple few, few joints or all. Post-viral is probably most common. And I think it will be very interesting. You guys can tell me. You, hopefully you might be picking up uh, with uh, post this uh, floods and, uh, and, uh, and mosquito season. We might be. I'm actually hearing it, not even my patients, but you know, nurses I know and friends I know getting Ross River viruses. The people have gone camping recently. Uh, the other differentials, obviously rheumatoid, and it can be seronegative, so you don't have to, you don't need to develop, uh, depend on rheumatoid factor and CCP antibody, but it still can be negative. Uh, and obviously the, the ones I'm going to talk about, sorry, arthritis and gout again. Okay, this is one presentation. This is a common one I see, and, and they sometimes come to my uh, OA clinic, uh, but so middle-aged male, swelling, knee pain, heel pain, they're a bit overweight to drink, 
and Fadox Ross's first degree. And this has got a swollen knee. You can see that again, you know, um, this is one of the presentations. Obviously, at the end of the day, we went through him, found his psoriatic plaques and aspirated it. And sometimes they do go have the arthroscopies by the surgeons before they continue. And quite rightly, sometimes with the acute presentation, we still need to make sure there's not an acute septic knee. Now, uh, these are the things, so they get a bit of inflammation. Now, the CRP and 30, so it's always good if you guys can check the ESR and CRP, although about 50% of people can have normal inflammatory markers, and the rheumatoid factor and x-rays are always normal. Uh, the other presentation, polyarthritis, um, this one I saw recently, um, those shared. One of the most important things is the early morning stiffness of one hour. That's I always ask my registrars and interns, is there early morning stiffness? Sometimes it's difficult. You've got to ask them, you know, how, how do you feel when you first get up in the morning? How do you feel before you can start moving again? Because people do get stiff for a few minutes, but they move, they're fine. And obviously find where, where they're stiff. Is it stiff in the back, in the buttocks, which is the sacroiliac joints, and obviously which are the joints, the polymyalgia, or the shoulders and all the thighs. She, um, uh, so most of these patients are, have other problems as below, and they've got all these other uh, uh, conditions which needs to be treated when you consider um, what to give them. Uh, they get carpal tunnel, uh, again, inflammatory markers when we're normal, and the x-ray of the hands just shows OA changes. So when you, and when you examine them, you can get, I'm hoping to show you some pictures, you get all this erythema and psoriatic plaques on the scalp. And that was the only thing she had when I saw her. So you can see all these fingers, they're a bit swollen, shiny and everything. I always ask them, can you put your rings on or not? And they've obviously have had this for a while. And it's very, very subtle. So they start off with steroid injections to the carpal tunnel, slow it down, start to methotrexate, and they've started some of the you get the inflammation now. So the CASPER criteria or classification criteria of psoriatic arthritis is basically designed for uh, research. So we're going to be a bit careful. Unfortunately, in rheumatology, we do a thing about classification or rather diagnostic. The problem with rheumatology, you know, there's no single biomarker that give you a diagnosis straight away. Basically, it, you need to um, find out they have an inflammatory joint. And the best thing, you actually need to see it. So if you guys see it or the rheumatologist sees it, or maybe take a photo and document it, they got an inflamed you know, knee um, and, you know, or uh, hand, wrist, and, uh, and you need other points from the others. So uh, a past history of psoriasis or a family history of psoriasis, first degree relatives, so the mother or father or siblings, nail changes, one point, negative rheumatoid factor, dactylitis, and the bone formation. But the most important thing is that inflammatory joint after excluding sepsis and the um, family history or their own personal history of psoriasis. So there is a big overlap among the seronegative arthritis or spondyloarthritis. I always tell my patients it's seronegative because all the blood tests are negative. It's very frustrating. So we know that they, uh, they all have a similar sort of uniting feature to sacroiliitis. Uh, so they get buttock pain, low back pain, but not all. And the difficulty is back pain is quite common and you do need to push it a bit and find out how common it is um, and how, how long have they had it since they found it, since the teens, or was this very recently? Is it mechanical or non-mechanical? Um, so um, the reactive arthropathy we're now seeing again, just being aware, we're actually quite interested with uh, no chlamydia and a lot of those, um, hopefully you guys will see it more than I do, uh, coming back on again. And I'm hearing, certainly hearing from the general medical units, young people coming with chlamydia. And we actually saw a syphilis, believe it or not, uh, a couple of weeks ago, someone presented with a rash on the dermatology. Um, so ulcerative inflammatory bowel disease is another big ones we see, and they all get swollen, usually big joints. And again, treatment of the inflammatory uh, bowel disease is important. Angspon, a juvenile, I don't see that much. They all come from rural children's. They actually diagnose and they come to me. Okay, this is the plaque. So I'm sure you guys have seen it very, and sometimes it can be confused with eczema. Uh, I'm quite lucky is that my clinic is next door to the dermatologist, John Sue, and they, they show us this very um, silver flaky plaques all coming off. 
and you have the different grading and they have all the PASI scores with the dermatologist teach me to get for their medications and can be pretty disastrous in some patients. It's pretty horrible. The dermatologists obviously see first things than I do. Sorry, where they are. Ah, there we are. So these are the areas to look for. <clears throat> the hidden areas, sometimes you've got very little. <clears throat> and behind the ears, the elbows, internatal plaque, those are the ones. And uh, the typical ones we always look for is uh, obviously elbows and knees can be seen and toenails is the other one. Need to examine the feet, that's the other thing. So there we are, the hidden areas. So very tiny, tiny ears, little things like that. And they need just to pull out the things for you to have a look at. Nails are very, very uh, informative for me, I must say. Um, so have a look for this little, as you can see, the onycholysis on the top left-hand corner with the nails of coming back. And then at the, at the bottom, uh, hopefully um, for me now, I have to take off my spectacles, but you can see the little, little dots, like this is some little pinpricks and it's very, very suggestive. And those some are quite, quite subtle signs, but just need a bit of time to look at it. GIP joints uh, that are really involved. This is obviously what I call medical student when they get it really, really bad. You can see the nails and everything. This is the one sometimes we bring in for the OSCE for them. But hopefully we're gonna see less and less of this and we can treat all this before it happens. Dactylitis, uh, patients will tell you, but very swollen, very painful. And sometimes it looks like an infection, cellulitis better. But uh, ask them to take photographs of it. They, hopefully they should present to you very quickly and you can see them quickly when it happens. And by documenting it, it's very, very handy to, to help. As I said, it's a journey. Sometimes they don't just present because they present with other things and eventually you know, get aches and pains everywhere until this happens. Now, enteritis is the other thing. So tendon insertion. So in psoriasis, very interesting. This is, comes from where, um, where the tendon actually inserts in the bone. And we think evolutionary, this is when where the fingernails or where our nails actually come out, where we get our claws and everything. So there's a lot of bone edema in, in where the tendons insert. And obviously people have been doing ultrasounds. Now, now these are research and I wouldn't be, you know, obviously be much better uh, to palpate the areas. So obviously <clears throat> you can see that little skeleton on the right hand side over the shoulders, um, pressing on or the leads, enthesitis, intact, sacroiliac joint over the trachyteric bursa. And I haven't seen you, but the other thing is obviously the Achilles tendon. Those are tendon insertion areas and they're very, very handy. And obviously ultrasounds do pick some of it up and uh, you do see all these uh, reports of trachyteric bursitis and ultrasounds and also shoulders getting tendinosis. And, um, and that's one of the things to be aware of. It's not, why would someone just have recurrent shoulder pain with tendinosis? It could be the first presentation of uh, psoriatic arthritis. So this is the tendons, I apologize for this, but you can see the right, uh, the, on the right side of your screen, the Achilles tendon is much thicker than the left side, I'm sure. When you palpate it, it's nice and warm to touch. So these are the juxta articular uh, changes on the tips of the X-rays. Uh, lots of um, <clears throat> lots of um, tips and moving and uh, changes, and you can see the Achilles tendon and the plantar fasciitis right at the bottom where the heel is. Again, <clears throat> so these are some hip changes, X-ray changes. I'll skip this through. Um, just briefly on pathogenesis, all I want to tell you, there's lots of cytokines. The dermatologists obviously, are, have, there are certain cytokines that could be more important for, uh, for a skin at the moment. Everyone's, you know, when I started, we only had IL-1 inhibition. Now it's now gone up to IL-17 and IL-23. So there's a lot of um, interest at the moment with IL-17, IL-23 inhibition, just to let you know in the area among the dermatologists and also the rheumatologists to see what, what's going to help with them. Um, the most important treatment, this is the ones that really well help. So psoriatic arthritis have comorbidities. The main comorbidities are still obesity, you've got metabolic syndrome, and forgetting about medication, these are all important. Weight loss, smoking cessation, alcohol intake. And it's obviously easier said than done. And this takes time. This takes no, no magic medication, no magic injection. No, no, you're going to go straight to bariatric surgery, but you're going to need uh, you know, encouragement from you know, your, yourself, um, good physios, psychologists, dietitians, and these are the things you can help with. 
because just by doing those, there's good way of modification. And we know that obesity and sorry arthritis has also increased skin disease. We know that uh, they get inflammatory cytokines or edible kinds and makes the medications worse. And, and it's not just in psoriatic arthritis, we live in osteoarthritis as well. There's a lot of research trying to get people to lose weight. And for those who read a recent article from St. Vincent's, doing bariatric surgery decreased, uh, um, decreased the knee replacement rate by 50%. And those patients had knee replacements, didn't want to have knee replacements anymore. So it was quite an amazing uh, local publication about only two years ago. Um, so that's also important get the, to, to get the weight loss. Smoking, as we know, is really bad. It makes, and forget about psoriatic, but also in, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, doesn't make methotrexate work as well. And it obviously increases alcohol. Is the other thing, too much alcohol. Obviously, I get worried already. These sort of patients probably have a higher incidence of what I call fatty liver, NASH ready, and with the alcohol, it's not good for me to start methotrexate on them. It's always a challenge. So um, we talked about smoking and infections and fibrosis with methotrexate. So these are the things if you can, um, any stopping smoke, smoking program is very important. And for those who get my letters, always I, I say stop smoking. Now, these are the latest recommendations only about um, uh, from last year. This is a big group called a GRAPA. So the GRAPA is a big Thoracic, sorry, to arthritis group composed mainly of um, dermatologists, hematologists, and all getting together to, to find. So they try and def de define it into what I call peripheral arthritis, axle disease, which is more hangspawn, enthesitis, which is the tendon insertion, tactilitis, the toes, skin, and nails. Now, modified with that, you also need to look at what patients' preferences are, their co what other comorbidities they have, because they all can, uh, they all can, um, can interact. But in general, we still use, um, you, know, um, um, you know, the conventional DMARs, which is methotrexate and salazoparin mainly. So we look at the peripheral and then we go into biologics. There's a lot of switching around. I don't want to go too much well on biologics because I'm happy for you guys to ask about biologics. But we, we do even among the rheumatologists have some debate which ones to use. And obviously we use the first ones that came up, you know, the uh, TNF alpha receptor blockers or before we jump into the IL-17 and the NH3. Anti-inflammatories we use quite a bit. I must say I like to use high-dose fish oil, three grams, rather than a simple uh, or tyrant and norofen. A lot of them have hypertension or, or GI problems. And uh, But anti-inflammatory is still in topicals, as you know, with the dermatologists. And all these topical therapies, dye laser, and lots of, lots of things that the dermatologists would use more than I do. Okay, so working up someone for uh, medications, including methotrexate, these are the ones, you know, I'm keen, hopefully we, we tend to do this, but if you guys have done it, that's great. Um, I need you to help me with the vaccination, with the flu, and even the shingles and shingrix uh, information, and I'll give you the references, but if you get on, this will be very useful for you too, because patients will always ask you after we see them about side effects of drugs. We've only got literally, even in our clinics at box only 15 minutes a patient. So we give them information to read and hopefully they'll digest it. And sometimes they change their mind. So we need to make sure they learn about methotrexate, allosparin, you know, not get pregnant while on methotrexate and all the risk infections and cancer. Uh, so this has been treated for six months on the flunamide. I must say I don't use the flunamide much anymore. Uh, the flunamide, when patients read it about hair loss, they tend to abruptly say, don't want to have it. And we need to qualify them for the biologics if we need to. Um, methotrexate, make sure you guys, I'm sure you all do well on your uh, weekly dose of methotrexate once a day. We just had a patient, unfortunately, just came in. I don't know, came in with a pharmacist and the pharmacy packed and gave the patient a daily dose of methotrexate. And obviously, guess what? She had bone marrow toxicity and stomatitis. So just be very careful that weekly dose is important. Hopefully on your program or most of the map is it should be weekly now. It's sort of a safety thing on the computers, but be careful of the um, 2.5 milligram dosing and 10 milligram dosing as well. So there's two, just be very careful of the doses you use. And these are the ones if you can help me monitor the blood count, bone marrow toxicity, the liver function test every four to six weeks and every three months. Sometimes you do ultrasound and, uh, and the other things, so keep on warning them about pregnancy if it's a female. 
Okay, so in, in general, what I just want to talk about is to, to try and differential the inflammatory versus mechanical, uh, because the mechanical, uh, which I'm hoping to talk about OE, which is at the very big areas, learn about the hidden areas of psoriasis, stop smoking, weight loss, and monitoring of, uh, of the medications. So I'll end there and uh, uh, open up it to questions. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. That was really in, uh, informative. Um, there's a question when you brought up, um, I think, early on, you know, the uh, red flags and yellow flags for septic arthritis. Yeah. Um, apart from when you suspect septic arthritis and send them to ED for essentially a joint aspiration and workup, um, are there any other situations where you would get uh, or refer for a joint aspiration in the community or do one yourself? In the community, are there any other clinical scenarios that that, that would um, where that would occur? Uh, yeah, look, I must say I, I do have patients coming into the Oaks Clinic, and, and we sort of do a sort of a diagnostic aspirate sometimes. Uh, so we see sometimes these are probably quite uh, they've had it for a few weeks, and uh, I, I also use it therapeutically because what we, your knees are so swollen. I had a unfortunately one lady we, we haven't. The trouble all of us with the COVID closing, uh, we didn't see this lady and the knees were so swollen. And, and when I saw her, I just aspirated and she felt much better. And but she, she was a rheumatoid lady, rheumatoid arthritis, a lady I knew quite well. So I was pretty confident, but I still sent it off to uh, to make sure there was no bacteria. And obviously I checked it that day, but I aspirated it and put some steroids on that day. But if you're concerned at all, uh, aspirate it and bring them back. It is always a challenge. I, I, I know that question about where, where joints get. I must say, I used to do, I don't know, we, we actually, I used to do joint in aspiration workshops for GPs. We actually had all these models. It was actually near Camelot. It was actually a GP uh, training area. But I think all of us are so busy now, we, we've stopped doing it. And we tend to send it off to the radiologists. Um, yeah, that's been my experience as well usually in the community. If yeah. we don't think it's urgent, we're referring to the radiologist for a joint aspirate. Aspirate, yeah. yeah. And then you don't get, uh, the trouble is that I think they took away the Medicare item number, so it's not worth for you guys to even spend. Because it still takes about, you know, 10 minutes and plus all your, you know, all your other stuff. You need all your syringes and everything. Uh, Chris, there's a, there's a question from Shinta. Um, at what age would you, uh, um, would psoriatic arthritis usually manifest, especially when um, they've had psoriasis since teenage years? Yeah, that's a very good question, Shinto. We're still trying to find out why some people will get it and some people don't. So we went back to Albert to see what triggers it off. So some people have psoriasis for many, many years. You think of it, we can say 20 to 30% of psoriasis, we develop it. But what about at 70%? They may never develop it, for all we know or they get very minor things that we don't have to worry about. So the, the, the so interestingly, so the, the younger ones tend to get the oligoparticular, the ones uh, I must say, because they, they usually present, they actually present to the orthopedic knee surgeons first with a very swollen knee and then they come to me um, because it's a single joint and everything. Um, I've also seen some uh, recently, uh, as I said, um, um, after uh, COVID vaccination, flaring up some of that, but they do settle down without doing anything. And uh, the other things are the um, uh, some 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 very unlucky middle age, forties, fifties, and they start developing very bad psoriatic arthritis. And is it stress that brought it up, and they just retired, and they they get very really frustrated because this is the age, you know, they're they're just over 55, 60s, They want to retire and go on holidays, and their arthritis all flares up. So I think there's still a lot of things we don't know about the medical history, and I think uh, I think we need to again, you know, it goes back to what, why some people get it, why some people don't, and what is the natural history. Have you, you know, to, to that respect, and have you ever seen a case of psoriatic arthritis where they've presented with joint problems before uh, the skin manifestation? Oh what yes, yes, yeah. Look, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I've got a very young guy, so. He had, in fact, unfortunately, he had already erosions and disruptions. And then I suspected, you know, what, what would young guy, is, is, is good, is a student and everything. 
and then and then you know a couple of years down the track then the sparse is a little you know so that's the other corollary so it's it's interesting we we don't know and as i said our our diagnostic and classification system is great yes um so chris is going to hang around um for the next uh, presentation as well because he's involved in that clinic too so if there's any other further questions that um the uh, Kind of the audience uh, can think of just um, type it into the Q&A box and I'm happy to ask him later as well um, all right thank you very much Chris that was great right uh, fantastic I just want to present our next speaker now um, Ms. Ali Gibbs, who's an advanced uh, practice physiotherapist uh, in the osteoarthritis hip and knee service, known as the Oaks at Eastern Health. Um, she also works at Access Health and Community. Uh, very busy, current PhD candidate and a research officer at La Trobe University, which is a, a very strong academic background there. Uh, thanks, Ali. Great, thanks very much. I'll, I'll hopefully this will work. Great. Uh, see those okay? Yeah, looking good. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for inviting me today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the GLAD program as well as the, the Oak service uh, here at Eastern Health. Um, so objectives, uh, understand the role of the clinics, uh, identify who would be a candidate to refer, and then how to go about the referrals. So sorry, a little bit of background before we start. So I'm sure as GPs, you're all very aware of the really high prevalence of both hip and knee osteoarthritis. And it also has a really significant burden both to individuals and to society. Because of the really high prevalence, uh, there's numerous guidelines that have been developed for the management of hip and knee osteoarthritis. And they all concur that exercise, education, and weight loss, if appropriate, are the cornerstones of first-line management. And that's regardless of pain, age, or severity of disease. So this is just a, a visual representation of what the guidelines recommend. So as I said, first-line treatment for everybody should be education, exercise, and weight loss if required. If patients are struggling to manage with this, then second-line treatment can be considered but this is an adjunct to first line treatment. It doesn't replace it. So that includes things like pharmacological pain relief, passive treatments such as TENS, acupuncture, walking aids. And then if all of that still hasn't provided sufficient benefit, then surgery can be the final option. But most people don't end up at the point of surgery. However, what tends to happen in practice is a little bit different. So this is data taken from a large survey, part of the beach data across Australian GPs, looking at the outcome of appointments for people who saw GPs for hip and knee osteoarthritis. So overall, approximately 6% of patients were referred to allied health. Between 15 and 25% were prescribed medication, including opioids and 13 to 16% were referred to orthopaedics. So people were two and, a half more time, two and a half times more likely to be referred to an orthopaedic surgeon than to allied health. Now we know that's not necessarily representative of what happens. Patients can self-refer for physiotherapy. They may feel that they're managing exercise on their own, et cetera, um, but it just gives an indication. There's also a lot of barriers to people engaging with the non-operative management. So patient beliefs, their treatment choices, their motivation to engage, um, beliefs such as exercise is harmful, it's going to make things worse, surgery is the only option. There's also evidence that health professionals can have similar views, obviously not everybody, uh, but that can include physiotherapists, nurses, GPs, orthopaedic surgeons. There's also social influences. So if your next door neighbour's had a knee replacement and is back walking a week later, it tends to make people keen to consider 
uh, the surgery is the, the main option. So quality education is really important to try and address the patient misconceptions. So the GLAD program was developed a couple of years ago now in Denmark, and it stands for Good Life Osteoarthritis Denmark. And it was developed to try and provide physios with some structured training and education and support on delivering optimal care to people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. So it includes an education component as well as the exercise. There's ongoing support for the physiotherapists who uh, have done the GLAD training. And there's also data collection of patient outcomes. So the GLAD program itself involves an initial physiotherapy assessment, some physical outcome measures collected by the physio, and the patient is then referred, sorry, registered on the GLAD database with online patient reported outcomes collected. The GLAD program itself consists of two one hour sessions uh, per week for six weeks, so 12 in total of neuromuscular exercise, and this is preferably done in a group. So there's uh, standard exercises that are meant to be um, included, but these can be modified and adapted as required, and they can also be added to. So it's not a strict program that is only these exercises. And importantly, it also includes two one hour sessions of education. Following completing GLAD, patients then have a three month review where physical and online outcomes are collected, and then again, online outcomes at 12 months. So why would you consider GLAD? First of all, exercise is very safe for people with hip and knee osteoarthritis, and it has significant benefits for the health of the cartilage. But a lot of patients are really scared to do it. And if they're doing it on their own, they can have flare ups, which make them reluctant to engage with exercise. So having it done in a supervised environment to provide that education and support can be really beneficial. Several systematic reviews have recommended the minimum dosage for people for exercise with hip and knee osteoarthritis is 12 sessions twice a week, which is what GLAD provides. Education is recommended by all of the guidelines. However, a recent systematic review found that education is more, more effective when it's combined with exercise, which again, GLAD offers. GLAD is generally run in group sessions, so it provides the benefits of social interaction. And there's also fidelity of treatment. So physiotherapists are required to recertify every year. So does it work? So this is a randomised controlled trial that was conducted in Denmark a couple of years ago, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they looked at a GLAD type program that included exercise, education, as well as some adjuncts of insoles, analgesia, and dietetics. They compared this to another group who had the same intervention plus a knee replacement. And both groups were patients who'd seen orthopedic surgeons and were considered appropriate for knee replacement surgery. The outcomes at one year was the group that had no surgery, so just the exercise, education, et cetera, had a 30% reduction in their pain. At the one year point, they were given the option of having knee replacement if they wanted to, and 74% felt they were managing well enough to not need surgery. There were no serious adverse events in this group. The group that had the combined exercise, education and knee replacement had a greater reduction in pain, so approximately 60% pain reduction. However, 11% also had serious adverse events, including one who went on to have eight further surgeries. The same cohorts were followed up at the two year point and the proportion who imported proportion who reported an improvement of at least 15%, which is considered the minimal clinically important difference, was just under two thirds. And two out of three still opted not to have surgery. For the surgical group, the proportion reporting improvement at least 15% was higher. However, there was still approximately 15% who felt they hadn't improved that much. The rate of improve, sorry, the level of improvement was greater for both pain and function than in the non-operative group alone. 
So surgery can offer more benefits for pain. However, people can still have really significant improvement in function to the point of no longer desiring surgery. This is data that was uh, collected from the, the GLAD data registry in Australia for knee osteoarthritis. And you can see it here that pain reduced at three months and these benefits in pain reduction were maintained largely at 12 months. And the same for knee and health related quality of life. This is data from the, the GLAD registry for people with both hip and knee osteoarthritis. And you can see again that both groups improve at the three month point and the 12 month point slightly more improvement in the knee group compared to the hip group. One of the outcomes they collect is medication use and they found a significantly reduced requirement for analgesia at both three and 12 months for both hip and knee osteoarthritis. Another outcome they collect is the desire for surgery. So for knee osteoarthritis at baseline prior to commencing the GLAD program, one in four people reported a desire for surgery. At the 12 month point, two out of three of these people no longer desired surgery. For the hip, it was similar with one in four desiring surgery at baseline and one in two no longer desired surgery at 12 months. So it can make a really significant difference to people's pain, quality of life and desire for surgery. So who should you look at referring for GLAD? basically anybody with hip or knee osteoarthritis. So the exercises can be modified. So people who have really severe functional limitations and severe pain, the exercises can be tailored to an appropriate level. There are some ex exclusions for the database for GLAD. So if people have concurrent back pain, which is their main issue, they can still do the GLAD program. It's just that their data wouldn't be included in the registry. So how to refer to GLAD? There's a website uh, that you can see listed on the screen here, uh, basically gladaustralia.com.au. And up the top, it's got a locations tab. When you click on the locations tab, it brings up this map. You can enter your location. So as an example, I did Box Hill. And every orange dot is a physiotherapy practice that has been registered uh, to provide GLAD. And when you click on the orange dot, it gives you the, the name of the practice, the address and the phone number. Unfortunately, GLAD isn't funded within the public acute hospital system. So options for referral are community health services or private physiotherapists. Using a care plan can be used for the initial assessment and three months review. However, the ideal for GLAD is it's run as a group, which isn't covered by the care plan. As I said, the ideal is the 12 sessions in person in the group, but it can be flexible. So patients who may need one-to-one -one or could only afford accessing physiotherapy through a care plan could look at this and then do a mix of supervised, unsupervised exercise at home or telehealth. The actual care that's received is again recorded on the database. So how many times people come to the session in person, remote, etc. Of course, GLAD isn't the only option. So exercise, as I said, is recommended for everyone, regardless of pain, age or severity, but not everybody would want to do GLAD. So any physiotherapy or exercise physiologist can provide exercise. For patients who may not have time, be working, have family commitments, etc., and not want to see someone in person, there's some online resources they could potentially use. So the My Knee website was developed by a PhD candidate at La Trobe University. It was co-designed with both patients and experts and is now being published. This is a free resource for patients where patients can find out more about how to manage knee osteoarthritis and it takes them through some questions so it's actually tailored to what they're interested in rather than having to read about everything. Patients can also use My Knee Exercise uh, from the University of Melbourne, which is an online 
knee exercise program over the course of a couple of months. And again, that's free for people to use. Also hosted by the University of Melbourne is Pain Trainer, uh, where patients can create their own account. This is more about self-management of chronic pain rather than specific for osteoarthritis. But again, it's another free resource. So touching on briefly now the osteoarthritis hip and knee service. So some of you may already know this, but it's a screening clinic that was set up for hip and knee osteoarthritis by the Department of Health a couple of years ago. So most of the models around metropolitan Melbourne use advanced practice musculoskeletal physiotherapists. Here at Eastern Health, we're very lucky to also have a rheumatology leg clinic and St Vincent's also uses rheumatology as well. The aim of OAKS is to comprehensively assess and then optimise the management for patients, whether that's non-operative or facilitating timely access to orthopaedics as required. For referring people to OAKS, the things that are really important is up-to-date imaging, so that's less than six months old, weight-bearing x-rays, preferably done at Eastern Health or IMED or MIA because we can access their images online, and finally, a full medical history and full medication list. This is to assist triage the appropriate clinic. And finally, a project that was done a couple of years ago was setting up OAKS in a community health service rather than in the hospital and looking at was this feasible. We found that it had high GP and patient satisfaction and there was a pathway in place to refer to orthopaedics as required with the advantage of on-site physiotherapy or GLAD. On the back of this study, a larger study is now being undertaken by La Trobe University. So some of your patients may be involved in this. So the study is called Motion, or Monitoring the Influence of Care for Patients with Knee Osteoarthritis. And in any patient that's referred to orthopaedics at Eastern Health, St Vincent's Hospital or Ballarat Health, will be offered the opportunity to take part in part A. Part A is just monitoring what happens over time. Uh, so patient outcome measures, economics, etc. Part B involves some of these patients being offered the opportunity to have their care provided in the community health service Oaks rather than the hospital. Again, there's the pathway in place to allow referral back to orthopedics as required. And the study is also funding the GLAD program and other care related to their osteoarthritis in the community health setting. So the aim is to see whether providing really timely facilitated care can overcome some of those barriers and change people's desire for surgery and outcomes. So this is just a flow chart of the, of the study. So in summary, Exercise and education and weight management if required is recommended for all people with hip or knee osteoarthritis. There are a number of barriers to people engaging with this care and GLAD offers one of the effective options to address some of these barriers. And finally, just a reminder, if referring to orthopaedics or OAKS after a trial of first line care, weight bearing x-ray and the medical history is important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. That was a, a, a great presentation. Um, we just have a look at the question. So there's a question here from uh, uh, from Alison. Um, can diabetic patients with OA uh, uh, use the care plan group sessions for GLAD? Yeah, so it's one of the really unfortunate things with the care plans is that they don't cover group physiotherapy, so they're only for one one-to-one -one physiotherapy. So the patients could still use it to see physio. And as I said, they can, can adapt GLAD. Um, so they could do some of the sessions one-to-one -one in person, potentially then get the patient doing the remainder of the 12 sessions on their own at home. But unfortunately, the, the way the care plans are funded at the moment, they don't cover group sessions. Yeah. Um... Ali, when I refer a patient with um, osteoarthritis to a physiotherapist, 
I don't usually uh, specify what type of program or exercise. I, I just kind of ask for help with management of osteoarthritis. How variable are the programs out there um, um, if we're not kind of knowledgeable in that area? Um, or they're quite consistent. There's a mainstream programs. Uh, so it's one of the one of the reasons why Glad was first thought about is that the care provided by physio, the same as in any profession, can be a little bit inconsistent. Um, so the the Glad program offers that sort of structured approach. So you know that if people are seeing physios who have done so to do Glad, they have to have done some training at La Trobe University to be accredited to provide Glad. Um, and so you know that the physios who have done the GLAD training have had that education from La Trobe and they know about the exercise and also the patient education side of it. So the, I guess the message isn't that GLAD's the only option. So any physio should be able to do a comprehensive exercise program for someone with hip or knee osteoarthritis, but the GLAD provides some structure to it so you know what you're getting with it. Um, Ali, there's a question from Grant. Uh, what's the waiting time at the moment for the Oaks uh, Clinic? Yeah, great question. Um, so obviously COVID has created longer, longer waiting lists. So we had a period of time where we were redeployed to other services. So Oaks was closed for a period of time, which has obviously created a backlog. Um, there is some money coming through from the surgical ref reform our funding, so we're looking to try and increase the EFT of Oaks to try and catch up on the, the backlog. So at the moment, as a rough figure, you're probably looking at around about four to six months. But hopefully it'll come down when the funding comes through for the increased EFT. Uh, there's a question from uh, Cheryl, is there an age limit for these programs? No, no. So, uh, yeah, anybody can can do them. Um, now, there's a question from Shinta. So when we make a, a referral to a GLAD program in the community, uh, what do we say to patients, especially with regards to the cost of the 12 sessions? Yeah, so if it's with a private physio, um, and the patients don't have private health insurance, they're probably looking at an out-of-pocket cost for each session. Of, it varies a bit from clinic to clinic, but probably around $30 to $40 per, per session. Um, if it's done through the community health service, the advantage with that is that it is subsidised by the government, so it's cheaper. So normally it's between $10 and $15 per session. However, the community health service also have some waiting times to get in to see them. So there's there's pros and cons with both. Um, when I'm talking about referring to private GLAD providers to people when I see them in Oaks, I normally suggest to them if they contact a couple of places that are close to home because they do vary a little bit in their price. Um, so if people contact a couple, then they can see what's most suitable day, time and cost-wise. Um, okay, thank, thank you, Ali. Um, there's just another question. Chris, are you still uh, uh, on the line at the moment? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there was just another uh, question about the psoriatic arthritis. Um, I'm just going to read it out. Can psoriatic arthritis manifest in generalised myalgia, non-specific low back pain, shoulder and iliosacral joint pain? Um, when they present in polyarthritis at a much younger age, would that person have a much poorer long-term outcome for management? So that's a two-part question, Chris. Two-part question. Oh, well, look, sorry to arthritis. Yes, it can. Um, the, the trouble is when we're saying with general, myalgia is always very difficult. It's very nonspecific. As I said, we'd be keen to look at more, the, the back pain, I'd be looking more like morning stiffness, buttock pain, so iliac pain. So you need to differentiate from mechanical problems. That's number one. And that's always the challenge. And uh, and it could be the angst uh psoriatic arthritis overlap. But most of the time, unfortunately, most of these people will have what I call mechanical back pain, even the B27 positive. So I know a lot of people like doing B27s, but B27s are positive in lots of patients. 
It's like anti-nuclear antibodies. I always get worried that it is like this morning someone uh, was coming with an ANA of 1 in 80 and wanted all these diagnoses. People pin the hope on a blood test. And this rheumatology is not like that. You don't pin your hope on a blood test or a... So you need to look again. Um, and if they present polyarthralgia at a much younger age, well, it's possible. Again, you need to look at which joints. I look at whether the joints are destroyed. Um, when I see joint erosions in the... So this is the one I was talking a bit earlier about. When I saw this, you no, know, it was only 20 years old horrible ankle, horrible hands, and then you did an MRI. Really, this guy had joint destructions, but he didn't have psoriasis, you know? And obviously, you do all the reactive arthritis in a young person and everything. So I even started treatment then. I think what, what you have to do is look at, um, yes, when, when you get an accelerated thing, some of this polyarthralgia, if there's an identified trigger or precipitant, hopefully it may have been a viral infection or even, you know, as I was saying, if they go away, that's great. If you can find the trigger, it's always trying to find the what the precipitant is. And, and the thing is, you need to follow up. That's great. Thank you, Chris. I think that was the last question. Uh, Ali, Chris, was there anything else you wanted to add to or talk about um, before we uh, um, say good evening to everybody? Yeah, look, please, please look at the website. I think you were going to show you the uh, healthcare pathways. Yeah. I think a lot of rheumatologists all in all of Victoria have been trying to put all these things in. Always, I know it's frustrating, you know, it's, even at Eastern Health, you only got once a week clinic. We do have a registrar and obviously you've got, uh, you know, we've got lots of other people like uh, Ali helping us and orthopedic surgeons. So it's trying to call us at the time when it's not available. Um, I, I was the urgent, urgent things I get worried about. The ones I didn't put in, I think, about times, it is always a worry. We don't like to see them in clinics. If you suspect that someone's got GCA and visual problems, we would prefer you to get them into emergency, get a biopsy and everything. If you've got private, it's much easier. You know, the public system is the shambles at the moment. But, you know, feel free to call the, um, we do have an acute medical liaison registrar in ED now basically all, all, all 24 hours, seven days a week. You try and obviously avoid people coming to ED, um, but you know, it's always a challenge and, and I do sympathize when this, uh, how, how we try and keep people ED and you guys are doing a great job, but how, how, uh, there's certain things, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sort of my rheumatology clinic with once a week, it's sort of fairly built up. We've got to close over Christmas and you know, we're trying to get more, um, uh, Alison, more physios, everyone to help us, it's a teamwork. It's a very teamwork thing. And we sometimes, as you know, even if you look at our latest, I think um, outpatients, we are trying to divert some, like they're more, for example, in rheumatology, I don't have access to psychology, pain management. And if someone's got fibromyalgia and all these other things, they really need that multidisciplinary thing because they, we, they, 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 they get very frustrated when it's this, we can't help them. And that's why we try to get to the pain group and everything. And I know, again, there's a long waiting list at Anglers and, uh, you know, and Lilydale, but how we use uh, you know, community centers each. And as you saw, Alison uh, um, has shown you all those GLAD centers and the physios, but I'm sure there'll, there'll be other sort of community health centers in Ringwood, each, those are the ones we can use as well. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, Nicole, if you can just pop up the slides of health pathways. I think um, there's a pretty extensive um, rheumatology section on it. So, you know, I've been using health pathways for a while. I find it very useful as a point of uh, care um, tool. Um, and I'll often open it up, um, you know, when the patient's there because it's very succinct um, compared to um, the other tool that I use up to date that can be a bit of a read. Um, so health pathways is great. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you already use it. For those of you who haven't, um, please look into it. Um, I'll just show you, if we just get to the page with all the uh, uh, summary of all the rheumatology conditions, um, there's a fair few that can help us get through them. Um, so um, these um, relevant pathways are made in collaboration with GPs um, and rheumatologists um, and orthopedic surgeons, ED physicians. So they're, they're, they're very collaborative in their approach. Um, so, 
when you click on a condition, it's something you think about. There's also, when you work through it, there's red flags, yellow flags, things to consider, investigations to consider as well. And the other thing that's quite helpful with these pathways is that they tie in a lot with referral pathways to uh, hospitals now as well. Um, so if you're referring for certain conditions, um, it'll ask you, it'll say, have you done this investigation first? Um, it works well in that way. So it's a really, really um, good resource. I would encourage um, all of you to have a look at it um, and make it part of um, uh, your battery of tools, um, especially as a point of care tool because it's very succinct. Um, it is free to use. Um, you just need to register for it. Um, if, um, if, any, if you need more uh, information about it, you can always email me. Um, oh, there, there's a slide about it. So um, you can just go to that website there and register um, for the use of Pathways. Um, were you involved in this, Chris, at all with the, the, uh, the um, development of some of these Pathways? Yeah, so the uh, Department of Health got all the uh, rheumatologists together in uh, just before COVID. And uh, we all had discussions about, you know, the uh, uh, seronegative arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis and everything. There's a lot of things still in, in, in involvement, so hopefully it'll be updated. The trouble is it's a bit dead for the last two years or one year. There was a, the main thing we had an email and saying that uh, septic arthritis we don't want to miss. Um, the other things obviously is the pathway there, but uh, hopefully every single public hospital will have, uh, obviously we all have our rheumatology registrars 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. And uh, it was really, really urgent, obviously, pick up the phone or patients we know. And obviously within our uh, catchment area, we'll try and help you. Um, I, the other things that will help us a lot is obviously um, when you make a referral, stay, all the tests and everything is downloaded. And uh, if not, the other things I always say, look, if you get the test outside, if you're happy to, um, happy to, for you to give it to patients. I must say, I, I print out my Melbourne Path or Dorovich. The problem with our uh, uh, EMR systems and CPF systems, isn't even like today, they keep on crashing, but they freeze with the citrix. And, uh, and it's, uh, they don't like, uh, if you can get blood tests done at Eastern Health, they obviously it's much better for us because we can look it up easily. But there's always the challenges and x-rays as well. So our x-rays with imaging independently or all or at Eastern Health is there. And my understanding, they're all bulk bill and rebate patients, even including the MRIs at Barunda Hospital. Uh, so that's quite a good resource there at Barunda, uh, if you ever need to. But let us know. And, and if you if it's an urgent, please pick up the phone, give my registrar a call. I mean, so the weekends, we have the acute medical eyes on registrar in the emergency. Fantastic. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Now, thank you again for um, um, presenting tonight. They were great presentations. I'm sure the um, uh, audience of GPs were very appreciative and, and learnt a lot about it. Um, we're finishing a bit early, um, but if there's any questions about uh, anything, um, you can email me and I can pass on those questions to, to Chris and Ali. Um, there was a question about whether these slides will be available. Uh, we can email them out to you later on with the certificates. Um, I think the, um, the uh, PHN will help me with that. Um, so we will do that uh, if you'd like the slides as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thanks very Thanks much, everyone. Thank you.